Well, hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Harebrain Games. Today we're going to take a look at a game called Downfall of Empires from Do It Games. This is one of two that arrived in a series on a Kickstarter that I backed uh, last year, perhaps, perhaps earlier than that. It has arrived. Its shtick, its appeal, is that it is a uh, army level World War I strategy game uh, that's fluid, exciting, historical, and fast. Does it meet the mark? Let's take a look. Okay, let's take a look at what comes in Downfall of Empires. You get uh, the large game board. Well, when I say large, it's not epically large. It's actually very well sized. Uh, it depicts all of the major powers involved in World War I. I've set up the starting scenario for the game, so you'll see units on there. You'll see a lot of tracks, technology tracks for each of the four powers. Uh, insets for certain uh, areas that uh, are going to be uh, instrumental in World War One as you go through the 18 turns, which are depicted here under game turns, going with the seasons. So you've got the uh, summer, fall, winter, spring, and all 18 turns. Each one, there's certain special events that trigger at the time when you when you get into those turns or exit those turns. You have a diplomacy track that uh, you'd use to bring on board neutral countries onto your side where applicable. Victory point track and every every of the powers will begin with a different uh, number of victory points, either negative points, positive points, as a starting baseline uh, for the for them, after which they'll accrue points, victory points over time for places they've conquered, for nations they brought to their side, etc. You also get uh, uh, little cups of chips. You're going to get every side has their set of units. They are finite. And you have in these, and then of course they get the die of destiny here, and technology tiles, which they'll use to make themselves better, give themselves a little extra oomph in combat. Some control markers you'll see here for the four sides, because as you take over uh, enemy zones, you're going to want to place control markers. It will make it easier for you to navigate through them, etc. And uh, you get the rule book. The rule book is. Uh, small four pages of actual rules coupled with some description of uh, like setup and then you'll get some examples and then you'll have player aids which will give you information regarding what uh, options you can do etc it's uh, very wordy but it's there for you and then there's an alternate scenario on the back uh, as we play I'm going to show I've done a personal rules companion, which may or may not be available publicly, I haven't decided yet, uh, which goes over, uh, it actually breaks down a little bit more. I found that it was easier to teach this game, especially in the large number of groups that I've played it with, uh, or experimented playing it with, uh, by having a, a more sort of fleshed out set of, of uh, information rules, and then you've got sequence of play, uh, breaking down each of the six actions each power can take, and then a combat resolution uh, breakdown as well, coupled with a, uh, a cheat sheet for what to do on each turn at the end of the round. So I use this, although that doesn't, of course, obviously doesn't come with the game. Uh, but if not, you have the rule book, which you may use instead to learn. With that, let's get into an example of play. So what is the purpose of Downfall of Empires? Well, you are going to be playing as one of four players, or in less player counts, you may be able you'll be taking multiple powers. But there are four powers in play, and each one of those is vying for control of victory points that will decide who wins the game. Uh, after 18 turns, whoever has the most victory points is the winner. You'll see in our sequence of play, we've got the German, Franco-British, the Russian, and Austro-Hungary powers, each one with a different set of actions they can take per turn of the 18 game turns that are available. So, on a given turn, and we're going to start 1914, is uh, in the summer. Makes sense. That's when it happens. I like to look at my cheat sheet in the 1914. There's no seeding of German armies to Austro-Hungary. That's something that will come into play starting in the winter of 1915. And we also know that the Germans have to attack a Franco-British Army unit during this game turn. So let's break it over here and we'll decide. Uh, the order in which the nations go is uh, the Germans go first, followed by the French-British forces. And that remember, that's one power. French-British forces, one power. Eventually, 
Some of the other nations may join them, the Americans and the Italians, but for now, they are one power, followed by the Russians and followed by the Austro-Hungarians. So let us just begin. What can you do? Well, uh, as the Germans, the first thing you do, first thing before we set up is that everyone's going to take a technology and they're going to decide the first three that they want to research. Now, you don't have to do this randomly. You can decide this privately, what you're going to do, and then you're going to place these technologies in group one as your, start, as your starting text that you're going to begin to research. They're not fully researched until they make it to here and then out onto your board at the subsequent turn. So, you'll see some of the technologies are defense that will uh, help you when you're being attacked, poison gas, which is a nasty one-off you can do once a year, tanks, which can only be researched after four other technologies have been fully researched, offensive, which gives you uh, extra opportunity for, for an attack and or for uh, an offensive, and then attack and defense. So these are all technologies that you're going to secretly be trying to get into play over the course of the 18 turns. All four of the powers have different uh, groups of technologies, although some are very similar. Attack, defense, you'll notice. Attack, attack, tanks, etc. Level 2, aviation. These all come into play during the course of your 18 turns as you decide. For now, I have seeded all four of the powers with three starting technologies, and that's what we'll do. All right, so we begin with the Germans. Now, the Germans, if you'll notice on the sheet, have three actions that they can take for every game turn. What are those actions? Well, I'm glad you've asked. There are six possible actions you can take, and of these actions, uh, pretty much only the first two are the ones that really take more than just a small amount of time to execute, really. Recruiting always has to be the first action you take. It's also one you may likely want to take because it helps get units on the board. So, how does recruit work? Well, as Germans, you'll see over here as we begin, the Germans and the French are in a pretty, uh, kind of where you expect to be. You've got uh, units, you can have up to three units in any zone. These zones are all owned by France, owned by Germany, etc., and trenches. Trenches become important, especially in this region. And these are, think of the one as hit points. Um, they can be upgraded to two, which is two hit points. Uh, their value, the actual potency of defense they provide, varies based on where they're actually placed. So these would be far more powerful. Uh, these would give you an extra bonus having trenches here than you would, say, anywhere else in a particular random zone. And you'll see that they have power. Every unit has a combat factor. This is kind of how powerful they are, or what they're gonna what they're gonna contribute to your uh, final combat score when you are in combat with them. We'll know that later. And each one has one side, and then a step loss, a reduced side, and then they're gone. So that's it. It's very simplified. So the first thing we can do is recruit. Now we have units along this front, so we can decide uh, as the Germans. We can actually look and see. If you see, we'll go in the recruit action, and you'll see that the Germans, if it's winter and they control Brussels, well, it is not winter, and they don't control Brussels, so they're not Franco-British otherwise, so they get three recruit steps. What can you do with those recruit steps? Well, you can recruit an entirely full-strength army for two, reduce strength for one, or you can take an existing army, and you can uh, take it up back up to full strength for one recruit step. So that's how you do it. When you're recruiting, you have to recruit in a city uh, of that of that uh, power's unit's nationality. So here, for example, it's very simple. It's Germany, so here's a city. So here or any adjacent controlled area, they can actually uh, go ahead and recruit. So we're going to do that now. We're going to take and say we're going to recruit a full unit right, right here. I think this would be a great way to be able to... And get ready for an offensive because remember one of the actions the requirements is that one of these actions we take has to be an attack all right so then we're going to do that we're going to do and then we have one more step we don't have any reduced armies for example if we if this was say reduced and we and uh in all we'd have to do is make sure it's in supply supply is basically if you can get to a city through controlled areas you you can up it up all right so in this case we're going to take another half unit and we're going to go ahead and put that right here and there we go maybe we're going to have to do something different okay we have just done recruit recruit is well that's what we got 
that's what we got. Recruits done. So now we're going to go to the next one, which is activation. That's the second. We have three actions. We've just spent one on recruiting. Um, we're going to do, you know, what we're going to, yeah, we'll do the, all those other ones later. We're going to do activation. When you activate, you have, you go into a sort of a sub phase where you can take up to three or four, if you research, research that technology units, and you can choose to do something with them. You can choose to activate them for the purposes of uh, any number of things. I'm going to go over that now. Let me show you that. When you do an activation, you can move a unit, one to four zones. There's some other prerequisite there. Strategic move costs you two of those units you can move to move one unit, but you can move it, basically you can sweep it all the way across controlled areas and sort of re reallocate it. A C move, port to port move, this is only for the US, but you can move from a port to another port. You can move and attack, move and support, attack and support. And all of it, it all breaks down pretty simply, but suffice to say, uh, anything that involves moving and attacking, you already have to be adjacent to the uh, zone you're going to attack or the unit you're going to attack in that zone. So let's say we're going to use this well we're gonna we're gonna move this guy and we're going to move this guy and we're going to move say and then we'll move this guy you know what let's just do this so then we're gonna move here and uh, you can use these if you want you don't have to so move here and then we're going to move in here and we're going to move in here now there's some rules that say that if you go into a zone and there are no friendly units in that zone you have to attack well that works out anyway so if you were in there then you can go hey i'm going to attack it's time to attack so i've moved all my units it's required that in an activation you have to do all your moving before you attack now we're going to attack this unit and how does this work well we're going to show you right now in combat You'll notice that uh, there's a few rules about how combat works. In this case, we are moving directly to an adjacent zone where only enemy army units are present, so we must attack. And then we have sort of a breakdown on how that works. The way combat works is that you always have to define, and we'll just let's just go down the list. First off, we choose a defender, an attacker, then a defender, calculate support, calculate terrain, cal uh, yeah, calculate trench, and Basically, go down all of these, it gets real second nature real fast. So the first thing we do is we choose an attacker. This unit is going to attack at that unit. So we've chosen an attacker, we've chosen a defender. Now we're going to go ahead and we're going to uh, ask ourselves, what about support? What support are we going to be able to uh, obtain here? And that works this way. For every, you can have up to three units in a zone. So for each one of these that doesn't have an enemy unit to block its support, it's going to add its support factor down here, plus two. So right now, all of these are going to contribute. This is attacking. These two are supporting. There we go. So now we're going to add up. This is the first phase, is adding up what the values are, the base values. And to do that, we say, okay, this is four. So this is a strength of four. This is a five. We add the support, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay. Now that we've had that, we've got nine to four. Then we go terrain or trench modifiers. We don't have any trenches. So if we did, then there would be a plus two uh, advantage here. So for example, if we'd attacked here instead, it would have been a different story. So nothing for the terrain so it's still nine to four then we do attack and defense technologies well we don't have defense or t technologies yet but if we did have the germans say have an attack technology of uh of say one and my defender had zero that would be an additional plus one and, but we don't have to worry about that so it's still nine to four and then aviation modifiers you can also research technology that involves aircraft that's right and when you do that you can spend mission points on this track which you we don't have yet but you when you get technologies or when you take that action you can add more points to add plus two to your role so right now uh, it's nine to four we don't have any additional modifiers so now we're going to roll the dice the germans roll and get six nine and six is fifteen one. Wow. That is a huge, stunning, what I call in my in my rule book, a major victory. And that denotes bad news for the British. So this is how it goes. We've just had a just a breakthrough here, like in no uncertain terms. 
So the final tally is 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. 9 and 6 is 15 against 5. If your combat score is twice as much or more of your opponent's combat score, you win a major victory. That's a what that means is, is that you don't take any losses at all. And your opponent, if they're on the defense, can't use trenches to try to absorb losses. So this is huge. Every time, if you lose combat, um, no matter what, you're going to take two two step losses, which is a hit. One hit will you know, take you down to reduce. The other will just eliminate you entirely, which we're going to do here, which puts our friends, the Germans, in good stead right here on this line. So uh, that was stunning. What had happened, yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty impressive. So that was a stunning victory. But that's how combat flows in the most simplest of terms. When you are done with that, let's say, say for example, say for example, and that was our third action, we've, that was our second action, our third action is going to be, uh, well, let's just go over the rest of them. So, say our third action was research. In research, you have an opportunity. You can either take one of these technology tiles in box one, put it secretly into box two, that's what you can do. Or you can take one of these technologies that you haven't even started and put it into box one. There's a timing thing. Research takes uh, two, two research turns after which, and then you have to wait until the very next turn after you've researched it in its finality to bring it into play. Um, so say, for example, we have this situation and we take another research. At the, no, no, let's do this. So we've done our research. So the next time on game turn two, when it comes back to our turn, we can take this and we can, we can either reveal it right away, which might have some advantages, or we can keep it hidden secret and, and for use as a surprise later. In the case of aviation, for example, we might want to reveal it earlier because what it means is that it lets us... Um, add, immediately add two points to the mission track, which is going to help us, but it doesn't have to. You can, you can wait on it. But there you go. That's what research is. It's very simple, but it's also very potent. Then we have entrench. What can you do in an entrench? Entrench let, lets you either take a single um, trench that's, that's uh, level one and upgrade it to level two, or you can, anywhere you actually have control, you can go ahead and and place it in the, so here you can put a trench here. And notice at the end of the turn, this is what I, I mean, now that we're solely in charge here, we now have control marker here. We do that at the end of the turn, just as a side note. All right, then we have diplomacy. Diplomacy is pretty interesting. When you choose to do a diplomacy action, you're taking, you can either move uh, units of your coalition, because every power, you'll notice the powers have coalitions um, that they that combine with them, and I kind of describe it here, but effectively it, it basically makes sense. Like if you're German or Austro-Hungarian, you're part of the um, the uh, Central Powers Co Coalition. If you're Franco-British or Russian, you're part of the Triple Entente. So what you're going to do here, and the Germans, if they wanted to do that, they could take any of these tracks here from the Austro-Hungarians or the Russians, and they can move them forward if they meet the criteria. What are the criteria? Well, during 1914 and 1915, you can move Turkey. And if you're moving it forward, you go two steps. Uh, if, say, the uh, British, the French British, or the uh, Russians did not want you to actually be able to, you know, to advance too fast, they could also do a diplomacy action and move it back one, just to kind of delay. In this case, we move Turkey forward. Now, after 1915, that can happen. So these are timely, and you have to be very aware. Once you get over here, one, you're going to get a victory point at the end of the game. Two, you activate Turkey. Turkey is now able to do things it could not do before. Every neutral nation is basically completely out of the picture. You can do nothing. You can't go into their terrain territory. They can't go out in your territory. You can't attack them. They can't attack you. They are as good as not even present on the map. Once they become part of the conflict, once they enter the war, then those bets are off. Then Turkey can make its way into Bulgaria. Uh, the British can come over and invade Turkey. It gets, uh, it adds that element to the fray. You're adding these uh, nations in uh, where they belong in the alliances that they historically belong to at that time. And finally, there's the mission. Now, once you have certain technologies like the tank technology or the aviation technology, as we discussed... This is as simple as it gets. You literally say, okay, I'm going to add four points. 
And if you're at four and you had four points, well, you're capped at six. Because you have to spend these points when you use these technologies and you have to go back and forth with it. So, for example, if I was to employ a tank tech, aviation technology for a conflict, and there's certain rules about how often you can do it, but say I was in the middle of a combat and it was time for me to go, okay, it's the calculate aviation step. I can spend a mission and go, yeah, I'm going to do that. Well, what if my opponent had mission points and they had the aviation technology? Well, they could go, well, I'm going to spend a point. I'm like, doggone it. Okay, now I'm going to spend a point, etc. Until one of you just gives in or... Yeah, or can't spend any more. And if the the aggressor, the attacker, you know, wins in that regard, then they get a plus two bonus for that conflict, which hopefully will help them to you know win better, etc. So that's it. Um, combat again. We didn't talk about trenches, but if there was a conflict with trenches. Again, they get a bonus modifier, but also if they lose, say for example that uh, a defender lost a conflict, they could use this, they could get rid of this trench to only take a half a step loss, for example. So that's a value of that. Or if it's two, they drop it to one, etc. And then if they survive, if the actual de- unit that got attacked, now don't worry about the others, but the actual unit that got attacked that was defending the lost, unless they're in a particular situation where they have... Um, a certain type of terrain, uh, or they were in a place with a level two trench, uh, then they don't have to retreat. And so trenches and um, and terrain, uh, and like some of the, like the forest terrain, etc. Any of these terrains, uh, mountain, forest, etc., or desert, uh, they don't have to retreat. Otherwise, they would have to retreat to a controlling area or be destroyed. And of course, the enemies would be coming in, etc., and contending for control of that region. So that's what that. So those are the six things that you can do on any given turn. Now Germany has finished its turn; it's done its thing, um, and then the the. The the French will go next. They get three actions. They could bring people into the conflict. For example, they could bring Italy into the conflict by working on the diplomacy track. They have three actions to spend, so they too might want to go, hey, I'm going to try for poison gas. Because once a year, I can use that to basically just in, like freely attack and like chop down a a uh, a unit an enemy unit here um you'll see that the austro-hungarians and the russians and we haven't even touched on those yet they have their own battles going on so not only do we have the germans going and then the british french going which eventually will include the usa uh then we go over to the russian side and the russians have their own issues going on they can also be they want to bring romania into the conflict if they wish also they have uh you know they have a lot of units they're not as powerful as the germans but they would be looking at this area too, building up their forces, moving forward. Austro-Hungary goes last, and both the, the Russians and the Austro-Hungarians only get two actions per per turn, and so it's a little bit different dynamic. It's you know you're you're really really eking out the value of what turn actions you're going to take on any given turn, um, and they once again they can go back and forth, they can fight, you can reinforce, you can bring them into the fray. Um, and over time, you're going to be fighting that. Now, there's an issue, you know, there's all kinds of little historical points. Like, for example, from 1917 on, uh, you're going to get Franco-British recruits going to go up or technology goes faster. Um, in certain places, certain years that uh, that uh, Germany has to attack or sorry, Russia has to attack uh, Germans in, at certain points. It just is part of the of the history. And then uh, there's even a possibility of Russian surrender, depending on how each of these is playing out. And after 18 turns, you're going to stop play and you're going to count out victory points. And uh, the victory points all are added up in certain ways. So for, and it's a little, it's not quite as simple as just add up all the, all the zones that you control. If you can, if you control enemy cities, zones with cities, then you get points for that. Uh, if you lose your own cities, you're going to lose points for that. If you have uh, diplomacy alliances in place, you're going to gain points for that. There's even some interaction between Germany and Austro-Hungary where certain of these cities, if the Austro-Hungarians own them, control those uh, zones with cities, then it's the Germans to get the credit. And there's other places where Austro-Hungarian, whatever they whatever they control, they also, Germany also gets a duplicated victory point. It's, uh, it, it's described and defined in the rule book, but it is something that you'll want to keep in mind. And it does keep a little fresh, uh, a fresh motivation for each of the four sides as to how they're going to go about working with each other while still trying to wind up with the most victory points at the end. 
And that's it. That's uh, that's the downfall of Empires. Uh, the board game. One to four players. Uh, now let's get into my final thoughts on this game. Okay, final thoughts on Downfall of Empires. The grand strategic World War I game from Do It Games. So, let's get, as always, as I do in all my reviews, I do the cons, followed by the pros, final, followed by my final thoughts. Let's get into the cons, and I think uh, there's an obvious one that's just not going to be, it can't be denied, and that is that the rulebook has caused, the rulebook's layout has caused a tremendous amount of difficulty in in really being able to ascertain quickly how to get rolling on this game. Um, it's been uh, a, a struggle, uh, not a Twilight struggle, but an actual struggle, at least for the English um, readers in the English translation. And I think, uh, and as always, they, they, they have stressed so much and the design so much was geared towards making it fluid, exciting, historical, and fast with a light rule set. They talked about it a lot. The fact is, and I've mentioned this in other videos, uh, condensed is not the same thing as simplified. And when you condense a game down, I've already waxed eloquent on this enough, so I don't want to beat a dead horse. Um, I don't want to beat a living horse either. But um, it's condensed too much when you can't, when you have a large audience of intelligent people who can't figure out all the rules in the situations they're in. It's just too much. It's uh, It was the single most thing. It almost turned me off from this game completely. In any other situation, I would have um, I would have just done what I usually do, which is set a game aside. I've done that many times where I'm like, you know what? This is just not resonating. The rule book isn't answering all the questions. If I took this to bring to game night, we're going to spend half the time looking on BGG or somewhere trying to figure out an answer. So I set it aside. This is the first game ever that I have not done that for, that I have actually stuck it through. And uh, that kind of gives away how I feel about the game, but it's also important to note that if you're getting into this, um, I spent weeks building a rules companion, which you saw. It's available now on Board Game Geek in the file section for this game. Please use it if you're going to embark on this game um, until the rules are fully clarified. That is not a ding. I'm done. I'm done hammering on this um, because I've done it so much on the forums and stuff. I don't want to come off as being grumpy because you're going to see a lot of positives coming coming forward. Uh, but there are uh, definitely take advantage of Board Game Geek, the opportunity the, of of the actual Do It Games being very active and helping out. The rules, you know, again, like they they've said, that's condensed. It's four pages, but if you don't, if it needs to be clear, concise, and complete. And if you can do that, then you will pass the test. In this case, it did not pass the test. That said, it's what you got, and it's still able to play the game if you read through the lines or, you know, whatever. Uh, but for me, as far as, and I have taken this to many, many conferences. I have played, taken this to every single game night since I got it. As we worked through, and I, I thank you to all the local people who helped me kind of um, figure out what we needed to know so that I could build that rules companion that would, now is part of this game and going into this game. And I'm not tuning my own horn. I've never done that before. I've never written anything to help a game. Um, there's just something cool about this. Oh, I'm getting into the pros too fast. Anyway, the other thing is uh, I don't have a ton of issues with the presentation. Matter of fact, I, it's it's a it's definitely a positive. I did think that I wish it, uh, like the trench counters, they've got a one and a two on them, and it's so easy for people. The natural inclination is that is their strength. It's not, it's their hit points. Their strength is determined based on which zone they're in, but it isn't really, it's told to you, but it's not really like mapped out in a clear framework for you. So that was a, and then exceptions to the rules in the rule book, you'll see them. Yeah, they're noted in green or whatever, but you just kind of, and then some of them are on the board too. But again, it, it was, easy to miss those rules without the extra companion guide. Now let's get into the, we've, we've talked about the rule book, let's get into the things I like about this game. The map itself is gorgeous. It's not even just gorgeous, it's it's really, really well balanced between being f like delightful, flourishing, artistic, but not being so busy that you can't really understand uh, what's going on in the in the map. It's a 
really nice touch a really nice balance between the two I love the look and feel of that map greatly I like that all of the different charts and the different uh, information you need to know the different tracks they're all on the board you don't have any extracurricular pieces that you're laying out there for tracks or whatever it's all on the map um, I mean it's that means there's less clutter around the table like you like your actual you don't have a ton in front of you. Like it's a very small amount of things for such a for such a, a, a broad scoped game. I'm very very happy with that. The map is almost all the space you're going to need on your table. I, I love that it comes with its own tray. Like that was nice. They didn't have to do that, and they did that because this is a low counter game. There aren't very many counters on it. That's another pro. But the com you know the components are just great. The tiles, the technology tiles, are nice and thick. I have no no issues with that. And speaking of the low unit count, there are games that I bought before that are like this game is a low unit count, so it'll be way it'll be easy for people to pick up and play, even if you've never played a war game in your life. I am I ain't falling for that no more. I bought one um, the other you know last year that was just a disaster to try to teach. Really low component, but then it doesn't matter how how, how few com counters you have. If the rule set for your game is such that you've got a lot of invisible things those counters do or situations you have to account for, that doesn't make it an easy game. Um, this is not a lie though. When they say that the low unit count is an indication of its simplicity, they are not lying. It's not just a low unit count, it's the perfect unit count. It's just right. It's the Goldilocks, not too hot, not too cold, bed too small, bed too big. This is just right. A lot of things in this game are just right for the type of game that it's trying to be. Um, I will say that this, you know, in simplifying a game, and this is where I think the design really takes off and show, shows its uniqueness. When you are simplifying a game, a lot of things you're doing is you're pruning and you're trimming. You're going, okay, like, can we strip down these things to get just this small rule set? Can we make the map smaller, you know, or stuff? Like, and again, speaking back to the map, I love how it's broken into zones and not hexes. I think the zones really add that sort of simple but still impacting regional spatial um, uh, ramification aspect of the game. Anyway, uh, the map, you know, you can simplify that down, but and the gameplay you could simplify gameplay it, to a degree that it really strips away a lot of the tangible enjoyment if you're looking for a media experience and this is something that I've seen before where you have um, examples of, of games that they strip it down so that you get almost a filler but they take away so much and they abstract so much that you really are knowing that you're playing we're just playing a throwaway game so you've got these throwaway you know seize Rome in 20 minutes um, you know, uh, you know, World War II in 20 minutes kind of stuff. Perfectly good games. I enjoy them. They have their place. And then you have, you know, squ Advanced Squad Leader, Fields of Fire. In the middle, you want something that's simpler, but not stripped away uh, to the point where you don't feel that awesomeness, that awesome scope of this side, um, you know, meshed with a simplification pass from the other side. And so this game tweaks every concept that's in a wargaming setting, uh, and massages it down and it whittles it down sort of like a master sculptor uh, until the concept and the practice um, become an approachable tune that's like singing in unison. It really does a surprisingly good job at, of saying this is a simpler game but it's not a stripped down game. And so I really think that's, that's, a, that's a positive for it. The other thing I like is that this game follows the flow of history as a deft guide giving a tour but it's not so rigidly as to make the game play itself. You are not having to, you, you have the historical inclinations, you have the nudges to do things in a historical way or to at least be aware of how history would have gone. You can make those changes. You can do some departures from that or focus your efforts differently to accomplish different things. But that background of history and how it flows versus how you, it's almost like the, the, you know, history is a ghost car. And you can follow, you can follow it, but you can also go off your path and, and kind of, you know, try some different things. And so I think it fits, it hits that, that that note just perfectly as well so kudos for that um, yeah I, I'm satisfied with the speed and the cadence of this game let's talk about what it really talks about there's one word I mean I could use simple streamlined blah 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 but there is a word that I think describes this that it uses and that is fluid 
this game is a very fluid game and it's not a myth I've seen that before we're like oh you just everything blends into itself whatever this game the fluidity of this game is what really sets it apart to give you a, a meaty game with a satisfying speed and cadence um, but always feeling like things are flowing quickly much more quickly than you would uh, other other wargaming equivalents you know for one of the things is that all but one of the actions can be taken quickly once decided they're literally like atomic actions I'm gonna upgrade this trench I'm gonna add my add some mission power um, I'm gonna do you know this or you know, do these do these you know, actions that are very simple I'm gonna research do, 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 do. that's powerful because it means that you're not really ever out of it you don't get to go get a snack and see how that you know the advanced squad leader game is going on the other side because it's not going to be long before you're back around again and uh, I think that's I think that actually is is a very a very meaningful thing for this type of game again for what it's trying to be you can research bam you've researched you can uh, you know do the missions you can do all you know missions are abstract but they're not so abstract that they're just sort of input that's off stage uh, they matter too uh, the you know especially the research track is important it, it customizes how you what your efforts and initiatives are going to be you get to make that macro decision that eventually will have ramifications uh, the powers are unique and fitting your powers you get your unique technology you get your units you get your minor countries that are going to come in and support you you know, but and, and, and so they're unique that way. They're also unique in how they have to deal with each other. How Austria and Hungary have to deal with Germany and Germany vice versa. You know, you have to have that partnership, warts and all, in order to be able to to, to have success as either one. Um, there's a polished plausibility to the game as it plays out, and that's you know, I just speaking again to the okay, Austria Hungary, you're weak. Germany's got to help you out, but at the same time, it's got to go deal with the you know over there with the French. And stuff, and so that becomes an issue, you know, or something as simple as trenches. Trenches are important, and we all know this who played World War One game. But it's not doing it by sort of explicitly coercing them to be important by the rules. It's just naturally by the way of going, upgrading the trench here makes the most sense. And, you know, I need to be able to stay here, hold the line. Uh, it just kind of naturally flows with the terrain and the situation at hand, and that's a beautiful thing. Uh, diplomacy is another thing that just rock solidly works quickly. You'd think it'd be too simple, like, oh, I'm just moving this down, what the heck, well, that was a quick action. No, it matters. It's like, okay, I do this action, and I have to decide, like, if they do one more diplomacy on their turn, they're bringing they're bringing reinforcements in. Do I spend one of my actions to pull it back a little bit so that at least it takes one more action after that? Like how am I dealing? You know, or bringing in Italy, bringing in that, or dealing with the Russian surrender aspect, and when does that become, a, a you know, a paramount importance? It's up to you as the players to to decide how that works. Um, I mean, it's it's powerful when they're off limits because it means you're not having to worry about them, but you also can't make use of them, and you can't even go into their realm. Uh, and it's powerful when they enter the fray. It's sort of like WWF wrestling when you're just like, oh, I'm, you know, tap your tap your partner so they can jump in the ring and help you. That's that's the beauty of of the diplomacy, and it's all done so simply. And um, you know, all of these things that I mentioned take the complicated situation situations within the war and distill them into these cinematic set piece battles. Uh, that fluidly take you as a player through your part of the conflict, no matter which of the four powers you're playing, or two if you're playing two players, whatever. Um, and the, again, the tension of partnership. Coin games do this well too, GMT's coin game series, but you've got this help me and I'll help you, but neither one of us wants to help the other friends too much. In, um, again, unless you're playing two player. Um, but even then you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to contend with that. It, yeah. I should, as a side note, two player, a little bit different than four player, but the rules are the same. That's not really spelled out, but you're, you're still as a two, you know, if you're ta two player, you're taking two of your powers that are friends, but you still have to make one of them, one of them wins, not the other. So, uh, and the other thing is I really appreciate the activity of the Do It Games um, publisher and the people that have been active on the floor. I, I will say they're nothing short of sensational for how they've approached this. They've taken heavy critique for their rules uh, from some very respected people. They've responded with zeal um, 
to to solve this and make it and fix this and smooth the pathway for gamers, particularly English gamers, um, wherever possible. They immediately ran through some quick videos to try to explain some things. They did uh, full gameplay videos that they've got up there, and they're continuing to do that for their games. They've updated the you know there were some rules out there that were sort of the wrong versions that they've updated to the right rules. They've answered every question on BG as best they can, and it's not easy because the translation um, complications have been pretty pronounced, but they've humbly committed to trying to get this game in a state where everyone can play it and enjoy it and um, you know at one point a few weeks ago I sent a very pointed very critical video of going line by line through the rule book and I wasn't sure how that would be received because it was very pointed it's not my usual like you know trying to be as kind as I can with words they answered every single question uh, they, they their response was very gracious they were like thank you for this they were grateful they incorporated the feedback they know that I'm just trying to make this game better now I can fault them for not having you know a great rule book out of the gate but I definitely will not fault them for uh, their immense response and efforts. I hope they're. I hope that this is setting for them a pattern for future titles to help them avoid the initial hiccups with the rules from this for future games in the download series. And then the last two things is combat is just right. Again, just on point, exactly what it needs to be, no more, no less. It's not too simple. It's not too complex. It hits the bullseye of just the right amount of inputs to the outcome. Um, the units, the units themselves are simple. I mean, they're, you know, you got your full side, your half side, and your done side. Uh, you know, but you're not dealing with heavy counter overload of like, you know, four or five things. And there's great. It's great to have counters that have five or six different pieces of information for the right type of game. That is not what this game is trying for. Uh, they're also not just damage sponges. Like, you know, they're not just, oh, this could be a square block for all I care. No, they have personality. They have, uh, you know, just enough they're exactly what they need to be, no more or no less. And finally, the victory condition management makes for a very interesting end game. I don't think that uh, the victory conditions were well explained, and once you see them explained, you see a real, a real inspired um, and unique take on it. It's more complex than it first appears, uh, and when you understand it, it's clever and it's historically inspiring uh, handling of how to calculate B BP. You've got your piggybacking of nations on other nations, shared impact of some powers to others based on what they've you know, gained and lost and, and grant. It's quite novel. It really is. So in summary, don't follow vampires. When I first got this game, you know, back late last year, I rated it a 4 because the rule book was, again, I was at the point where I was just going to set it aside, rate it a 4, and say, I'll come back when some aftermarket, like, help comes on or if they ever figure out the rules. And most of the time, I never come back. Most of the time, people are like, yeah, we're on to our next game. Um, points to them for not doing that because there was something that was gnawing at me, which is that I, even as I was trying to read and get through and understand the game, I was seeing some really clever things. I'm like, I don't want to drop this. I just... I feel something's in there that really um, that really resonates and so um, that's when I decided you know what rather than wait for someone else to do something I'll do something about it what the heck and put my money where my mouth is let's see how I do it writing a, a you know something to help people out I think it's been well received blemishes and all and I, I'm definitely going to continue to work on the rules companion that I wrote for it on Board Game Geek so if anybody has feedback that's where it is I've gotten some tremendous feedback uh, to help me fill in the gaps fix errors and whatever but I'm you know the hope is I have taken that to again game conferences uh, play you know places where meetups and stuff and it's it's really really expedited growing the game and so once I got that done I rated it a seven and since then I played this game even more uh, and its appeal and the things I'm finding about the way that it plays out in two and four player, I haven't done three player much, but two and four player games, it's appealed to me, continues to grow. And right now I put it at eight, you know, eight and a half, might even get to be a nine because it is the game that hits the niche between light war gaming and heavy war gaming that I have been looking for for a very long time. It's the fa it's that favorite local restaurant you can take your friends to and have the confidence they're going to have just as good of an experience as you. It's the perfect on-ramp for people who are playing Memoir 44, Axis and Allies, and they want to move into a more of a war game setting, uh, you know, but they want to have a good time and not and not be bogged down with, um, you know, 
master class requirements. It's a great short session game for veteran players who want to just enjoy a serene uh, setting dealing with a major conflict with lots of depth of play without having to consume a dictionary's worth of rules. Um, you know, this all, Downfall of Empires started out as a hope for what it should be. I literally found this on some sort of kick, like Facebook link that's like, hey, back this now. And I'm like, eh, you know, you know, what every game wants to do a simple light war game, but something was just like, you know, I kind of like, I gave it a risk, and um, it started out as a hope that this might be what I'm, what I wanted it to be, and then it got bogged down in a bacage of rules issues. Um, it made, you know, but that made me go out of my comfort zone to write a rules companion, and then that reopened the opportunity to of this game to become the reality of the awesome game that I hoped it would be. I've not been as excited for a series like this in a long time. I want more downfall games uh, because the design hits a perfect note of fluid, fast, historical, approachable gameplay that's filled a void in my collection like no other game has. Um, and I can say that after playing it more than any other game this year, researching it and writing things about it more than any other game in my lifetime, I can say that this game design is an exercise in brilliance and a delightful pleasure to play. Uh, both play and introduce to other players. So top notch, um, with the caveat of of uh, the the rules, but the additional bonus of having uh, a, a, you know lots of support. I would say this a game is an absolute keeper. I'm astounded and grateful to have it. I hope that it continues to grow, and I hope that they continue to put out more games in the series like it. So that's it for today. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time on Hairbrain Games.